Okay, so this is uh, this is the agenda for tonight. I'm sure everyone can see that. Yes. I'll just leave that up for a few minutes, and we'll start. And uh, well, it's almost seven thirty. We'll start in a couple minutes here. I see we got about thirty-five people right now. I thought there were more little ice time. I thought so too. Still got a small well in the pictures. Well, this was a good idea to put the Okay, so here is our agenda for tonight. Uh, we have Bruce, Doug, Alistair, uh, Michael do the minutes. I'll do a quick what's up section. Uh, Abdur will do Astro Imaging Corner and then we'll have a few announcements. And let's see here. So welcome everyone uh, to the uh, May meeting of the Edmonton Center, the RASC. I uh, wish we could meet in person, but uh, that is not possible uh, in the uh, current climate, nor will we meet in person in June. Maybe we'll meet in September, but um, the uh, I'm not a glass half full kind of guy. I'm more of a glass is a broken and on the floor and everything spilt out. There's glass all over the place kind of guy. So I, I don't think we're going to be doing this uh, any time until maybe, maybe November, December, but we'll see. So our first speaker is Bruce McCurdy, uh, well-known uh, writer, man about town, walks around St. Albert, posting interesting stuff on Facebook, uh, writes for the journals Cult of Hockey, um, he does it all. He does it all, knows it all. Um, and he's going to be talking about uh, Venus tonight. So I will turn it over to Venus or turn it over to Bruce and I will mute myself. So Bruce, just have to hit uh, you know, talk and then share screen and you're away to the races. Am I talking already? You're, you can talk now. You can hear me okay? Uh, you're a little muffled. Hey, Mike is right here under me. Okay. I gotta figure out this share screen screen nonsense is the problem. Oh, this looks like it. I will click that, it should come up. Hopefully you can see it. Okay, we can see it. How's that? Coming through okay? That's good. All right. All right, so I'm just going to talk about uh, Fun with Venus. Uh, this was the talk I had sort of thought, thought of doing for the March meeting, and then Jeff made the silly mistake of giving me more time, so I went for the bigger talk, and I apologize to those who may think I overextended my welcome that time. I'll keep this one short. Uh, I started with this fun picture I took the other night of a tree snag pointing the way to Venus. In case you didn't know where it was in the sky, which many people apparently just do not. But I don't think that number would include anybody at this meeting. Uh, it is a beautifully photogenic planet. Uh, this is just a simple cell phone picture of, of Venus uh, reflected in the Sturgeon River the other night. But I've got uh, 
just a handful of photos that I've snapped over the last few years here. Uh, Venus with the moon always in the crescent phase, the moon when it slides by uh, Venus, very often Earth lit, so we can see the entire moon as well as the brilliant planet next to it. And of course, in this case, uh, the sliver of the Mutart uh, Conservatory. Alice, you may remember that morning. You can tell it's a waning crescent moon, so this was an early morning shoot. Uh, and anytime the moon is in the sky with Venus, and especially here where we had Jupiter as a bonus uh, planet. I got my stained glass to spill off the window. Sorry about that. Good timing. Uh, this was one taken just after Christmas last year of the penthouse suites in the uh, Fantech Tower, adding a little class to the place. And uh, this was taken from Commonwealth Stadium, again with Alistair, who is often uh, my, well, he is my mentor and uh, often my companion at such shoots. Uh, this one was taken down near Red Deer, and here's the moon sandwiched between Mars on upper left, Venus on lower right. And then this one from uh, September of 2017, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but from lower left it goes Mercury, Mars, then the thin crescent moon, uh, the star Spica, and then Venus up top. So the entire inner solar system, and of course the red glow betraying the presence of the sun along the horizon with Earth below. So we really have the, the entire six uh, of the inner uh, solar system in this one shot. And then this one, which was a particular favorite uh, taken at um, uh, Lake Annette at the Jasper Dark Sky Festival in 2015. Uh, I was situated between Alistair and Alan Dyer. You know you're in the right spot for an Alistair photograph when. And uh, this was uh, just a beautiful uh, pre-dawn or rising dawn uh, gathering of Venus being the bright one here. That's not the moon. I was slightly overexposed to get the colors below with uh, Jupiter and Mars to the lower left. So, uh, Oh, Bruce, could yeah. I get you to speak up just a bit? Uh, you can you still, hear me? Well, we can hear you, but you're very muffled. Wow. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I got my microphone right under me. I'm wondering if it's going through the computer mic, you know? Because I have a high-quality mic, like two inches from my mouth. So oh, is, is it plugged in? Uh, well, it's green, and it's flashing at me, and I turn it up, and obviously something's not quite working. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it's on the computer. Sorry. Uh, okay. uh, just do the best you can. Okay, well, I'll move the computer closer to me then. Uh, I've got it all worked out for Skype, but this Zoom business is a uh, different ball game, and all these things seem to need a um, uh, their own specialized settings, I would think. Is this any better? Yeah, that's better. Okay, I'm now leaning into the computer. Uh, I am, uh, as those of you who know me, you know I'm very interested in cycles and repetitions of things, and I'm particularly fascinated with the uh, with the eight-year cycle of Venus, which is very, very good. Uh, in that period of time, Venus does almost exactly 13 revolutions to eight of the Earth meaning Venus overtakes the Earth five times in that span for uh, five synodic cycles. And their, their apparitions are very similar uh, one to the next. And uh, change just slightly. You can see that the, the pentagram inscribed here isn't quite perfect, but it's very, very close. Yeah. So here's a, here's a representation of uh, the uh, inferior conjunctions of Venus, uh, that's when it lines up, of course, uh, between the Earth and the Sun on the uh, uh, every 1.6 years, uh, doing a very gradual, very slow rotation against the, uh, against the background sky. Uh, and the date's moving ever so slightly forward by about two days every eight years. So this is a representation of those, uh, those cycles from uh, uh, the great Jean Mias, uh, Mathematical Astronomy Morsels, or one of those books, uh, showing 
This particular one is showing greatest eastern elongation, but really it could be any of Venus cycles. It shows uh, uh, basically each of the straight lines is an eight year uh, interval, and the large humps are the greater Venus period of 243 years, in which uh, major events such as transits of Venus repeat after that span. So the eight year period is very, very good. Uh, and uh, for centuries at a time, uh, those are the best periods where you get, the, you get the, most, the cleanest repetition of events. And it's only after 30 of those that you really need to make a correction of any sort. And here's a couple of pictures taken by our very own Murray Paulson of uh, uh, the apparitions of Venus in the Pleiades, uh, which Venus goes through the Pleiades uh, on April 3rd at eight year intervals. Uh, and it's been doing so since the 80s at least. And here are the two most recent apparitions taken on April 2nd of 2012 on the left and April 2nd of 2020 on the right. And if you look closely, you'll see Venus's position has slightly moved a uh, little bit to the right. It, looked, uh, it went through the Pleiades a little more centrally the next night on 2020 than it did in 2012. And it will be still more central in 2028 than it was in 2020. And so it, it's but so close that really you can count on a very similar set of circumstances occurring from uh, one Venus cycle to uh, the next one eight years later. And here's one of my WYSI representations showing the four major events involving Venus, uh, which is the, uh, uh, the inferior conjunction when it's between um, Earth and Sun with a yellow background the superior conjunction when it's behind the sun on the far side, the black background, and the other two are the eastern and western elongations when it's maximally away from the sun to one side in the evening sky to the east or to the morning sky in the west. And one of the things that's quite cool about this is that all of these events happen at very uh, specific times of the year. And here's the same uh, the same sequence shown uh, as, a, as, a, as a graph and inverted so that the, uh, that the years are running vertically and the months are, are, uh, uh, are horizontal. Maybe I've got it backwards so you can see it flipped from the other one. And 2020 on the extreme far right shows that the uh, Eastern elongation occurred in early March. Uh, the interior conjunction is upcoming on June 3rd. And then the Western or morning elongation will take place this year in, uh, uh, in mid-August. And if you look across the chart, you'll see all of these events always occur at the same time of year, in, in uh, first part of January, in, uh, in mid-March, uh, in uh, late May, early June, actually, there's still early June as to now, and so on. So they're, they're uh, because the periods involved are all 0 0.6 or 0 0.2 years, you wind up with these increments that it divides the calendar neatly into five portions. And you can always find these events at, at, one, of these, uh, uh, at one of these dates. So here's another representation of the eight year period. And this one's a little bit more important. This is the transit of Venus. And this shows the crossing path of Venus relative to the sun. Uh, in early June in each of 1996 when it passed grazed just below the sun and missed it, to 2004 when it passed through the sun's southern hemisphere, uh, 2012 when it passed across the sun's northern hemisphere, so those two were of course transits of Venus, and then in 2020, alas, uh, it will graze just north of the sun and just miss, miss it. These are all series A as shown at the very top of the table here. And you'll see that the two transits that are circled in blue are both within about 15 arc minutes of the uh, center of the sun. So the sun's about 30 arc minutes in diameter. So anything plus or minus 15 minutes of that will actually uh, cross the face of the sun. And that's why even though Venus shifts about 20 um, arc minutes uh, over each eight year span, it's possible for there to be two consecutive transits of Venus, but only ever two. 
then all the other uh, inferior conjunctions occur at very different uh, uh, intervals where they are far above or far below the sun, anywhere between five to eight degrees above or below the sun. And those are actually visible uh, with a telescope and a very carefully, uh, car very carefully guided telescope with an experienced user who knows what he's doing. It's possible to see Venus right on the day of the inferior conjunction when it's passing that far above or below the, the sun and it shows a very pleasing crescent when it does so. So here are the two transits of Venus. Uh, I'm thinking there's probably quite a few people in the room tonight. I, I would, I would, in a room, I would ask people to raise their hands if they saw the first one or the second one or both. But any of you who saw both, you are the co-world record holder for most transits of Venus observed in one lifetime. So I don't even think Franklin goes back to the uh, event of 1882, which was the previous one. And I, nor anyone else on this Zoom cast, expects to live until 2117 when the next one takes place. But we were very lucky in North America with a little bit of travel and persistence to see uh, both the events in uh, June 8th of 2004 and 2012, June the 5th. If you ever see a picture and you don't know which one is which, if there's sunspots in the picture, it was 2012. In 04, the sun was naked, other than that spot and I guess that bird. So the 2020 apparition, here it is, and almost all of the excitement with Venus occurs within about 10 weeks before to 10 weeks after the time of inferior conjunction. And the inferior conjunction uh, this year takes place on June the 3rd, almost the same date as those two transits, but a couple of days earlier, and like I say, it'll miss the sun as a result. Uh, but you have to go all the way back to last August for when it was behind the sun, superior conjunction, very small, full disk, 100% illuminated, but only a little under 10 seconds in, in size. So very tiny disk. Of course, you couldn't see it when it was uh, closest to the sun, but a couple of weeks to either side, it was visible, certainly at the observatory. Again, carefully visible at the observatory to... Uh, uh, to spy Venus uh, on the far side of the sun. But really when it's back there, it's not all that interesting. It's round, it's bright, uh, it's got, uh, you know, no real features to speak of. But as it approaches the Earth, it gets more and more interesting and changes more and more rapidly. And this is uh, especially true in the 20 weeks or so around inferior conjunction when it goes to uh, uh, greatest elongation this year on March 24. Uh, by that point, it's only about 0 0.7 astronomical units from the Earth, and it's, it's uh, getting particular, uh, significantly close. Uh, it's about 50% illuminated, and it's about almost 25 uh, arc seconds in diameter. And then it just keeps closing in. By uh, about five weeks after that, it gets to a point called the greatest illuminated extent, which the first one occurred on April 28th. And that's when the combination of the thickness of the phase and the size of the disk is the absolute greatest that it can be uh, that we can see the most of Venus. From then on, as it continues to approach, the phase thins out more rapidly than the disk itself grows in size and it starts to lose brightness even though it's still uh, approaching the Earth. It's quite a complex equation, uh, but it usually happens when the, uh, when the uh, planet is about 27% illuminated and about five weeks before and after inferior conjunction. And you can see that even at that point, only five weeks away, it's still 40 degrees removed from the sun. Uh, only a few degrees less than the maximum elongation that it achieved five weeks earlier. So in the first five weeks, it only goes about seven degrees closer to the sun. And then in the next five weeks, it, it takes out the entire other 40 degrees. It just swoops in and through inferior conjunction. So those first two things have already happened, but what's coming right up in the next, uh, well, this week, actually, the first stationary point is taking place on Wednesday. And that's when Venus actually begins its retrograde motion. I'll, I'll speak more about that with a different slide. Uh, but at that point, basically now, 
It's now grown to uh, close to 50 arc seconds in size. It's only about 0.35 astronomical units from the Earth, so not much more than 50 million kilometers away. And it's still 29 degrees removed from the sun, so very well uh, placed to be observed in the evening twilight, in the deepening evening twilight, as it still sets pretty late. And it's still very nice and bright at magnitude minus 4.6. Then it swoops through inferior conjunction on the day of June 3rd. At that point, it's nearly one arc minute in diameter. Uh, it's under 0 0.3 AU from the Earth, and it will just skim by the sun and have an illuminated fraction of effectively zero on the third. And then you'll see the exact same uh, stages occur in reverse as it pulls away from the sun and joins the morning sky and very rapidly pops out into the morning sky that it will be uh, visible uh, well before June 24th. So it will be in theory uh, possible for someone to see uh, uh, the uh, retrograde motion of the sun. And by mid-August, that's when the greatest elongation occurs. It's basically one year from last year's superior conjunction. There's that one year that that repeats are these important uh, uh, parts of the cycle. And from there, the show is, it, it's still okay, but it's, it's, it's receding and it's going to gradually get less interesting from there. And then all the way till March of 2021, when it reaches the next in, uh, superior conjunction. So here's a representation of the phases of Venus and the apparent size of the disk as it comes around the sun and approaches the earth and you can see on the bottom right that's when it's really getting close to inferior conjunction we have a slender large disk approaching us. Uh, here's a different way of doing it this is from John McDonald of Victoria Center. Uh, this was forwarded to me by Dave Robinson a uh, long time Edmonton kind of Center member uh, today and I thought, yeah, I can include that. And he's just basically stacked up a, a sequence of uh, Venus crescent phases, uh, just showing the, the increasing size and the diminishing phase of the disk and, and really shows the effect nicely there. And then this one, this was posted on the internet by a guy whose acquaintance I made when I replied with my, my praise at the fabulous detail. This is what Venus, what you can do with the, big camera and a telescope and a Venus filter, 350 nanometers. And you can see he's captured quite a bit of detail in the atmosphere of Venus, which I can say is having observed Venus probably, I'd say thousands of times by now. Uh, <laughs> I've never seen this with the eye and a telescope. It's just, uh, it's uh, getting out of the vis visual range of, uh, of what's possible, but uh, with the right filter, uh, you can have uh, you can have fun with Venus in that manner. So a little bit more on retrograde motion. Uh, this is two two um, uh, two figures I posted in a orbital oddities column on the Journal of the RASC in uh, 2003, and this is actually showing the retrograde motion of Mars as seen from the Earth, and that's the retrograde loop on the left, and on the right is the retrograde motion of Earth as seen from Mars. And as you look at them, you can see that they are flipped versions of each other. That uh, in each case, uh, the general motion is west to east, right to left, uh, but both planets as seen from the other will undergo a retrograde motion. Uh, the outer planet is seen against the opposition point, but looking inwards towards the inner planet, you see it against the sun. So obviously it's a whole lot harder to track that. Uh, and you're not, you're gonna have a lot of difficulty seeing it when it's in tight. Um, but at the beginning and the end of the retrograde loop, which are called the stationary points, uh, the sun is far enough out of the way that it's actually possible to, uh, to spy uh, Venus uh, in this case, which is about a six week uh, loop that it does. So here is a, um, uh, here is from Stellarium, uh, just a representation showing Venus's uh, uh, retrograde motion against the sky. Uh, 
I captured the motion here from April 1st, just before it went into the pleadings, uh, right up to uh, uh, July 11th or so. And Venus is actually plotted in its position in the sky on May 13th, when it's at its uh, first stationary point. And you'll see it's quite close to a bright star, El Nah, uh, which is uh, in the constellation of, um, well, it's Beta Tauri, and it's also considered part of the Pentag Pentagon of Auriga. It's the horn, the, the northern horn of the bowl. And a nice bright star, and, and Venus has been pulling up near this star for a number of nights now. It's just been getting closer and closer. It doesn't ever quite get to it. It's just screeching to a halt, but uh, El Nath uh, proves to be a very, very useful star against which to track uh, Venus. It's kind of the signpost. As it gets, Venus gets close to it, it slows down, stops, and then starts to dip down and away from El Nath. And last time I looked at them, both of them were comfortably in the same field of view of my uh, low power uh, uh, Brandon refractor. And uh, the star shone through with no problem. Now, the issue is, of course, every night the sun is moving one degree closer uh, to the star. And the, so the, the pair is getting lower in the sky and the star is, is starting to get a little bit lower, you know, in brighter sky. So it's a little bit trickier to pick up. But Venus, of course, is dead easy. In any kind of binoculars or small telescope pointed in that direction, you'll pick up LNAP as well. And you'll be able to use it as, as your, um, as your uh, basically your fixed point against which the uh, beginning of uh, Venus's retrograde motion can be tracked. And then the other end of that, in six weeks time, it's sort of T minus three weeks that it starts. And that, of course, T is in period conjunction of T plus three weeks is when the second stationary point is reached and that'll be over by the uh, by the Hyades, another easily recognizable part of the sky with the bright star El Dibrin. Not, not quite as close to Venus as El Nath is at this point. Uh, and Venus will be a little bit lower. It'll have a, 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 a significantly lower declination. So it'll be a little bit lower in the morning sky, but it should still be easily findable uh, again, approaching 30 degrees uh, elongation from the sun uh, before it slows down and stops uh, on June 24. And then from there, it turns around and, and makes a direct turn towards Aldebaran and has a very close path to Aldebaran uh, around July 11th. It'll pass about one degree from Aldebaran. So that'll be a highlight in the morning sky. So, between then and now, we have one other uh, thing to look forward to, which is a conjunction with Venus and Mercury, uh, best seen here on the evening of May 21st. Uh, it's a quick conjunction because Venus is falling towards the sun and Mercury is pulling away from it. So uh, it'll be very different from one night to the next. But on the evening of the 21st, if it's clear, uh, both uh, objects are comfortably in the negative magnitude uh, and will present a very different appearance. Venus, a very thin crescent, just 5.5% illuminated. Uh, Mercury still in the gibbous phase, still coming out from behind the sun, uh, about 70% illuminated and in the negative magnitude, about one degree apart. So you'll want with your telescope a low power, uh, a low power image uh, in, the, in the field of view. And you should comfortably have magnitude minus 0.6 pick up Mercury, and again, of course, Venus is dead easy. So the pictures here are from space weather from a previous conjunction when both were closer to the sun. So the, the difference in phases was even more extreme, but uh, this one should be pleasing to the eye and a little, little easier to, to get because it's a little further out from the sun, about uh, 18, 19 degrees uh, elongation. So there will be a narrow window on that evening of May 21st. And finally, a challenge. Can you see the crescent of Venus with your unaided eye? If you have 2020 vision, better yet, 2015 vision, uh, it's doable. My wife was able to do it in her earlier life, for she had the eyes that the astronomer would give his eye teeth to have, but uh, I've never been able to do it. Uh, but it's a little easier in binoculars. And of course, as Venus approaches the Earth, uh, the crescent phase becomes more extreme and the size of the disk size of Venus grows. And the trick there is to look in early, early twilight. 
before this uh, twilight starts to deepen and the glare of Venus starts overwhelming the uh, capacity to see fine detail. Uh, so find, find Venus as soon as, uh, as you can near sunset, even maybe a little before sunset, and give it a shot and see if uh, uh, you can see it. Here they are for comparable size, uh, the moon about 30 arc minutes, Venus a little under one arc minute, so uh, significantly smaller, obviously. And again, here's a shot just for the scale of the two, and I'll say thank you for listening. Well, thanks, Bruce. Um, I'm impressed. <laughs> you well, said it was going to be short, and it was, so <laughs> thank you very, very much. Now, uh, for questions, if you have a question for Bruce, you can just go to the bottom of the Zoom window and type something in the, under chat or there's also a Q&A. So I'm just having a look and see if anything's going to come in. How do I unshare that screen? Oh yeah, yeah, unshare the screen. How do I do that? That's good. Uh, still being shared. So are there any questions? Oh, here we go. What do we got yeah, here? Bruce, move your mouse to either the very top of the screen or the very bottom of the screen, and you should see the toolbar pop up. Okay. Okay. So Martin Connors is asking, cool, how do I make a, pentag a pentagram plot? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I think if you look at the one that I posted in the journal, it said I had help from Alistair Ling. Or maybe it was Russ Sampson, anyway. Uh, it, it's, uh, yeah. It, it's just a matter of uh, getting the, uh, the RA uh, of, of the event and just plotting them in, in order and then plotting them against the circle. But I would have, uh, I would have difficulty with uh, uh, describing that. In, uh, yeah, the uh, solar longitudes. Oh, Martin also asked, do I need to join a coven? Uh, <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, there has been a whole hell of a lot made of that. If you really want to take a deep dive into the bowels of the internet, uh, you can find uh, all kinds of wacko stuff about the, uh, the pentagram of, of Venus. But uh, I wouldn't go there. <laughs> yes. Stop video? You're talking. No, you okay. Yeah, uh, we got one saying uh, unless you're talking, mute the mics. Any noise you make comes through the entire webcast. So, uh, so. Okay. Are there any other questions? I guess that's it. Okay. So uh, now we have a tag team here. Uh, we've got uh, Doug and Alistair. Uh, they're both going to talk about uh, comets. Um, Doug is going to explain the ins and outs of comets, and uh, Alistair is going to do something called wither, wither, and want, which I have no idea what that means, but I'm sure we'll find out. So uh, without further ado, uh, take it away, Doug. Click on that. Click, just click every, anywhere. No, in the, in the, uh, oh. All right. Okay. All right. Oh, oh. yeah. Okay. Um, We'll be with you in a moment. Yes, well, guess who's not sitting in the chair? Oh, That's okay. <laughs> My computer engineer is working on the problem right now. Right. Okay. Come on. Oh, no, what happened? There's my program there. I, oh. 
So nice to see you two after that adventure on the cruise ship. Don't want to repeat that. <laughs> We're there. Okay. Um, since there are several comets in the sky at the present time, and people have been following them for weeks, if not months, and we're now waiting for another comet to appear on the eastern horizon, it seems a good time to discuss the subject. Uh, I have no intention of covering everything about comets, but just a few historical and recent results that uh, I found interesting. Uh, that's the comet I think that we're waiting for, Swan. And uh, typical of a comet, long tail, anacoma. And you note that the tail and the coma have different colors. And this is the one we would love to see repeated, Hale Bopp from uh, 1997. That is not a picture which I took. Uh, showing again, in this case, uh, quite a bit of structure in the tail and not only a difference in shapes, but a difference in color. So what we, we can see with the, oh, before I go any further, I should point out what's behind me. Uh, over my left shoulder to the right on your screen is an image of Comet Bennett, which uh, Bruce and I discussed in, or referred to in email messages a couple of weeks ago. So that's a photograph I took in March of 1970. Hard to believe that's 50 years ago. Uh, and uh, it was a nice comet, not a spectacular comet, but it was a, a classical observation of a comet. Over my right shoulder is a photograph from the 1986 apparition of Halley. Again, not a great view, but uh, a decent comet and something we all enjoy observing. So with the comets, just by uh, looking or nowadays photographing with your uh, digital camera, you see different colors in the tails and you see what quite obviously are different dynamics. So that alone tells you that there are different materials within comet tails and by inference within the coma and the nucleus of a comet, different compositions and different physical structures. So these are not simple objects in any respect whatsoever. The uh, first spectrum of a comet, as far as I've been able to determine, was obtained in 1868. And you see two spectra uh, taken in the laboratory of carbon or carbon compounds and rather faintly below you see a spectrum of the comet of 1868 and you can see the similarities in what we now recognize are those are molecular bands associated with carbon compounds in this case in the comet. A somewhat better comet in a spectrum, but of historical importance, was that obtained by Huggins in 1881. There was a very bright comet that year. And now you see the typical composite spectrum with the dark absorption lines of the solar spectrum, plus the bright emission lines from the comet. So again, that's telling us that we're looking at a fairly complex structure, chemically and physically, Another feature that we associate with comets are meteor showers. Again, a naked eye observation. You can't read the list probably, but the point is that meteor showers are the debris of comets and uh, they produce typically not terribly bright meteors, but there are exceptions, of course. So we're getting a collection of relatively small particles, presumably held together by some sort of glue that is weakened when the comet comes within, is exposed to sunlight, solar radiation, and uh, again, suggesting something 
about the structure of a comet. So we now know that uh, the two tails called type 1 is formed of a gas, more exactly a plasma. Uh, type 2 tail is some sort of solid material, which we tend to label as dust. Uh, the coma, which is the source of both tails, has to be a mixture of gas and dust and the nucleus, which normally one you know, they observe directly as a very, almost a, a point-like object, has to be very small. So those are all telling us something about the structure of a comet. An important feature of showers, of meteor showers, is that no meteorites have ever been discovered that can be associated with a shower. So the particles of solid material uh, has to be composed of friable, easily fractured material, and again, the term dust is usually used to describe that material. The name that we associate with uh, the modern picture of the structure of a comet is Fred Whipple, who lived for 97, 98 years, a good long life, professor at uh, Harvard in the third quarter of the 20th century. Uh, he did a lot of things other than tell us what comets are likely to be composed of. Uh, he uh, introduced Operation Moonwatch before the very f before the first satellite, artificial satellite, was launched, and that was a program to monitor these things by eye from the Earth's surface. He discovered several comets, one of which bears his name and is a uh, short period. So Whipple's model, now about 70 years old, is that the nucleus of a comet is a nice conglomerate. That is uh, a mixture of small particles, again, something that we might call dust, bound within ices, and commonly referred to as a dirty snowball. Uh, prior to Rip Whipple's time, Comets with the comet nuclei were thought to be sort of uh, clumps of sand like particles, presumably with a coating of ice, but uh, rather weakly um, association of small particles. So we now recognize that the glue that holds the particles together are the ices and they sublimate when they're exposed to strong solar radiation. And uh, the glue giving way, the dust is then released. And we now understand that the dust is pushed away from the nucleus by radiation pressure, and the gases, the plasma, the ions are drawn away from the nucleus by the solar wind. So, that is a, a model which explains most of the observed characteristics of comets. And uh, the next step is, of course, to observe these from space missions, uh, preferably close flybys of the nuclei. So there have been quite a few missions to the comets, uh, beginning in around 1978 and continuing up until just a few years ago. So they've had various degrees of uh, success and produced some pretty good information about comets. Uh, Halley's comet is obviously a prime target. And interestingly, whoops, there we go. Let's go back. Int Where are we? Get with you in a minute. There we are. Interestingly, NASA did not launch the space mission to uh, Halley and its 1986 apparition. And that was for financial reasons. I think that was a big uh, miss, obviously, in the history of uh, these uh, studies. Uh, in 1905, the Deep Impact mission approached uh, Comet Temple 1. And I recall that a lot of us from the Edmonton Center went out west of Edmonton hoping to observe a 
sudden flash of light from that comet. We didn't see it, but it was an interesting evening nevertheless. Uh, Stardust was a flyby of a comet Wilt 2, not Wild 2, but Wilt 2. And Stardust, after going past Wilt 2, was redirected to go back to Temple 1 to have a look at the impact site from uh, six years ago, six years before. And as it turned out, the impact site was just barely visible and it looked as though the uh, material ejected from the impact site actually fell, a lot of it at least fell back into the crater and filled it up. But the uh, most interesting mission, of course, was the European Space Agency Rosetta mission to uh, the comet, which we will see in a moment. Back to Halley's Comet in 1986, there's my photograph taken with an old camera that I no longer have using somewhat insensitive film, but it was a, a lovely sight to see. And we actually went south to Peru for what we thought would be a better view, but in fact wasn't a particularly good view, but a nice trip to Peru. Uh, so here we are, uh, some results. On the left, you see an image obtained by the Vega mission from the United USSR. And that originally was a mission to Venus, one of the Venera probes, and uh, redirected toward the close passage of Vega, of uh, Halley's Comet. And on the right, an image taken by Giotto, of the European Space Agency. So here for the first time, really, we can get a good measure of the dimensions of a well-known comet. And you'll see another set of dimensions a little bit later, which are slightly different, but it's a highly irregularly shaped object. And uh, depending on which way you make your measurements, you get slightly different results. And one of the important things, which was not a surprise, was that the nuclei of comets are very, very dark. The albedo here is only about a quarter of what it is for the moon, and we know that the moon's surface is not a great reflector of light. One of the features of that uh, Vega image is that it looks to be a double-lobed nucleus, suggesting maybe composed of two nuclei which gently collided some time ago and adhered to one another. And the image that you see from Giotto, you see discrete jets of gas from presumably discrete hot spots uh, scattered around the surface. So from Halley, for Halley's Comet, then here's a new set of dimensions. The nucleus measured in a few to a 10, 10 and a half kilometers, depending on which direction you measure. A rough, porous surface, probably not a surprise. An opportunity to directly measure the rate at which mass is lost near perihelion, and that turns out to be about three metric tons per second. Very low density of the nucleus overall. Uh, different types of dust particles some rich in the lighter elements and some richer in the heavier uh, elements, including some metals. Very small dust particles in general, although we know that there are some that are much larger than that. Uh, why we always compare with smoke particles, I don't know, you're not supposed to smoke at the telescope, but a typical <laughs> dust particle is about the size of a particle and cigarette smoke, and information about the composition. So in Halley's Comet, and as it turns out in most, but not all comets in the solar system, water is the dominant constituent of the icy material. There's a lot of carbon monoxide, some simple compounds of lighter elements, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, some hydrocarbons, and some heavier uh, 
so-called metals. I did a very, very rough calculation. Uh, if you take the density and the dimensions of Halley's Comet, you find that it's about 10 to the 15 kilograms with an uncertainty of a factor of a few hundred probably. And if it lost mass of the stated rate continuously all the way around its orbit until it all was gone, it would live for of the order of 10,000 years. Now that's at best a lower limit for the lifetime of that particular comet because obviously it doesn't continue to lose material at the rapid rate that it does when it's near perihelion. So it's no surprise then that Halley's Comet has been observed regularly for something of the order of two to two and a half thousand years. And it still has thousands of years left. One of the most exciting cometary apparitions in our lifetime, or the lifetime of guys as old as me, was Comet Shoemaker-Levy in 1994. I think most of you know the history of that discovery, and our good friend uh, David Levy took part in that event. So this is a comet that impacted Jupiter, and it was first discovered when the nucleus had already been disrupted, and the disruption of the original nucleus is almost certainly due to tidal effects produced by Jupiter. So the, the original nucleus fragmented due to tidal forces, and the tidal forces on a relatively small object uh, in the vicinity of a non-stellar object, those tidal forces can't be very strong. So in spite of that, uh, the, the nucleus was disrupted. And then subsequently, we had bits and pieces of the fragments themselves further fragment and dispersed into a diffuse cloud. So it kind of faded away. So that tells you that the particles, the basic particles within the nucleus are probably very small and friable with very little mechanical strength. Another modern discovery of comets is the presence of a hydrogen cloud around the nuclei near the time of perihelion passage. So here's the hydrogen cloud discovered through observations in the ultraviolet from a the SOHO spacecraft, and these clouds are huge. Uh, Hale-Bopp's cloud wasn't the first to be discovered, but it was certainly one of the earlier ones. And you see the image of the cloud, and I won't go into the details of why it looks like that, but probably uh, the uneven emission or loss of material from the nucleus. And what you actually see, visually or through your telescope, is very, very much smaller than the hydrogen cloud itself. And that hydrogen cloud is obviously, the hydrogen came from the water content of the nucleus, which was pho photo dissociated by solar radiation. And here again, a measurement was taken of the rate of loss, and it turns out to be billions of kilograms per day. But this was a fairly large nucleus, maybe 40 kilometers, in its greatest linear dimension. Uh, and even at that prodigious rate of loss of material, a comet like that could survive many passages by the sun. Oh, Hale-Bopp's comet will not. It's on a very long period orbit. And we come to Ro the Rosetta mission, which carried on board a lander called Philae, and this was visiting 66 P Churyumov Kerasimenko. And you recall the one of the images of Halley's nucleus appeared to be a double load structure, and clearly that's what we have here, again suggesting that there might originally have been two cometary nuclei which gently bumped together, stuck 
and now we have the result that is seen here. Uh, that cometary nuclei might occasionally bump together and adhere, that is, find themselves in interplanetary space, tells you something about the space density of cometary nuclei uh, in the early history of the solar system. And on this image, you can see a variety of surface structures, uh, in particular pits, none of which to my eye look like classical impact features. So a lot of this pitting and irregular structure is probably the result of activity on the cometary nucleus made possible during the perihelion passage. And you can see examples of the dust, the very small friable material that coats the comet and seems to have moved over the surface. Uh, the Philae, well, Rosetta itself, I think, came within about a kilometer and a half of the nucleus of this comet, and then the lander went right down to the surface. And again, most of you will know that the lander unfortunately disappeared under a cliff and was not receiving the full solar radiation. So its batteries died prematurely and it wasn't as productive as had been hoped for. Here we see actually a, an active spot generating a stream of gas from the surface. Lots of craters, some of which maybe are impact craters, but I think most of them are due to the activity intrinsic to the nuclear, uh, the nucleus of its, itself. A uh, very close up view taken from a distance of 40 meters as Philae was coming down and geologists and geodynamicists and geochemists have probably had a great time analyzing what all those structures represent. We see clumps of material, again, something you could probably tap with your finger and would break apart into smaller particles. But we also see the uh, very, very fine dust particles scattered here and there over the surface. Uh, another image taken from Philae on the way down, I'm not sure what the distance at this point was, but, but you can see that even, even allowing for the uneven illumination by the sun, you can see that there are different structures, different reflectivities, presumably different chemistries, uh, different physical structures. So obviously a somewhat inhomogeneous and complex uh, structure physically and chemically. Another close-up view. Uh, this one I like because you can see crack here. It's not a crack associated with any particular small physical structure, but it looks as though on a fairly large scale, the uh, nucleus of this comet is breaking up. You see, again, uh, low density, small particles that appear to have drifted across the surface. Keeping in mind that these things have a very, very weak surface gravitational field, uh, that might tell you uh, something about the physical structure of the material that appears to have moved. Another image of comet, we'll call it CG. Uh, in an active phase, when close to perihelion, again, the two lobe structure shows, but you can see these individual streams of gaseous material uh, streaming out from hot spots. This is one of my favorite pictures of this particular comet, uh, a series of photographs taken at different times. And here, this is the first one is here, the, the uh, circled object is just the same object for reference in each image. But here's a cliff, which is obviously collapsed. 
And the debris from those collapses or landslides appears down here. Most of it fairly small. Unfortunately, I don't have the scale of this, but small fragments of material. It looks like a bit of layering here, which might be related to the way in which the cometary nucleus was formed. But the important thing is that there's a crack on the edge of the cliff right here. And here you see that same crack from a different direction. But in this later image, it's disappeared. So that is a piece of the surface crust that fell away in a fairly short period of time. Uh, not because it was struck by anything, presumably, simply because the, of the weakness of the material and it slumped away. Now that sort of activity is probably important because it turns out that the fine surface material has a high insulation value. So it tends to protect the underlying material from solar radiation. So if you have material slumping away here, it exposes some of the previously interior material to solar radiation and can add to the activity of the nucleus. Again, another lovely picture taken from Philae when it was close to the surface. So some uh, results from these various space missions. Uh, water ice has been detected directly on the surface and as a result of the impactor uh, below the surface. There are organic materials that are carried away in the tail, first into the coma, then into the tail. And organic materials on a comet may have some implications for the origin of life on Earth and elsewhere. Uh, the particles show evidence of being exposed to different thermal regimes. Some of the uh, molecules show characteristics of having been exposed to very high temperatures. Others condensed under low temperature conditions. So they must have, the components of the nucleus formed at different distances from the proto-sun were transported to the other solar system, presumably, and that's where they combine to form the nuclei that we see today. Uh, the surface material has a very fine, fluffy structure, so again, high insulation value and uh, protects the interior from solar radiation. The dust is a mixture of fairly small grains and larger grains, uh, some higher density than others, but in this case, high density is really, on an absolute scale, pretty low. And those factors, those characteristics of the dust particles of the gases differ from one comet to another. Uh, the dominant constitution of ice in the nuclei of comets in our solar system is water. Uh, in the case of comet Wilt, Iron and copper sulfides were detected, and it is generally accepted that those sulfides are formed only in the presence of liquid water. So again, that's telling us something about the early history of the formation of comets. On the other hand, no hydrated silicates or carbonates were found on Compel, Comet Temple. So two, two cometary nuclei, possibly with significant differences in their history of formation. An amino acid was found, and we know amino acids are found in me some meteorites and in interstellar clouds. So if you want to speculate about the origin of on the Earth, you can uh, take that into consideration. Uh, in at least some of the comments where it was measured, the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen, heavy hydrogen to normal hydrogen was higher than in terrestrial waters. So that would suggest that the water of comets is not what provided the water on the planet Earth. That's a highly controversial uh, conclusion, but it's a possibility. Um, and again, we've uh, measured the rate at which material leaves cometary nuclei and the sizes of the comets. 
So one of the more interesting cometary discoveries of the last couple of years was Comet Borisov, which on the basis of its orbit came from interstellar space. It came from another star, and it has been traveling for a very, very long time. And one of the interesting features of this interstellar visitor was that there's more carbon monoxide in it, that comet than in uh, solar system comets. In fact, the carbon monoxide is more abundant, was more abundant than hydrogen, just the reverse of the situation in uh, comets in our system. Uh, somehow, somebody's re inferred that the home star of this comet was a red dwarf. And what it tells you at the very least is that comets can escape from their parent stars. They do escape from their parent stars. And presumably this means that comets are escaping from our star and are traveling through interstellar space and maybe on another planet somewhere in the universe. One of our comets has paid a visit and has been observed. So it's an interesting subject, still lots to be learned through observation and uh, interpretation. And we are fortunate to have a chance this year, particularly good for comets. And we're looking forward to comet Swan rearing its head above our eastern horizon very, very soon. So, a few more conclusions, but I think I've probably used my time. I haven't used my, my wife tells me I've used up my time. So we'll end there. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. That was great. Uh, I recall, uh, it seemed, uh, doesn't seem that long ago that we were out looking for, at the uh, deep impact in 2005. Uh, yeah. The thing I remember the most is all the mosquitoes and uh, we did see a, an NLC display that night, so. Green. Yeah, I'm green, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. There. No, no, the green one up there. Yeah, okay. All right, is there, are there any questions? Uh, just type them into the chat or the Q&A bar at the bottom, or maybe it's on the side on your machine. It's on the bottom on mine. Let's give it a few. If anything comes in. Oh, here we go. Okay, uh, this is from Tom. Owen, what temperature does the surface have to reach before the tail starts to form? I have no idea. Good question, though. I'll look it up. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Let's see here. I, I see Glenn's question. Um, again, I don't know the answer to that. Remember that was a 19th century observation and they may have had different terminology. I've never seen that term other than in that particular application. Is my, work, my mic working better now? Yes, you're, oh, yes. you're live, Bruce. Great. Yeah, I, fixed it now. In, I fixed it just in time. Did anybody hear my talk? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we heard it. We fine. Uh, Doug, um, <laughs> double-lobed uh, comets. Uh, I was surprised to see that about Halley. I had not taken that in before. And of course, now we have the uh, Rosetta's Comet. And of course, we have the uh, famous uh, Kuiper Belt object that was visited by New Horizons. Yes. Are they... Uh, more common than we might have expected? Double lobed objects? I think when they were first observed, there was a bit of a surprise, but you think about it, it and we have lots of examples now of binary asteroids. So a lot of the smaller objects of the solar system are accompanied through space and uh, you know, close enough that impacts are not impossible obviously not impossible but uh, in the early solar system uh in the solar proto solar nebula the density of material was probably high enough that this was a common occurrence 
in the case of Halley's Comet, it depends on the angle at which you right. look at it because the other image didn't give any hint whatsoever of a double lobe structure. Thank you. Okay. Um, I still don't know why I'm green, but I'll, I'll work on that. Uh, <laughs> Alistair, do you want to get going? Oh, you, you're, you're muted. You got to unmute yourself. Whoops. Unmute. There we oh, go. There you go. Okay. 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 Um, thank you very much, uh, Doug. That was very illuminating. Uh, one of the, the interesting characteristics of comets is uh, quoting our uh, Canadian uh, David Levy. Uh, uh, comets are like cats. They have a tail and they do what they want. And so that's um, part of uh, the title of uh, this little bit. Whither, meaning where. Wither, of course, uh, being withering away. And want, uh, what we want out of our comets. And as we're uh, seeing, uh, they do what they want and not uh, what we hope for. Um, so uh, as you can, as you've probably all known for a couple of weeks now, uh, Comet Atlas Y4 is dead. Uh, and then, uh, or is it? Uh, we just recently uh, received some images from astronomer Terry Lovejoy, who is himself a comet discoverer, and he has recorded Comet Atlas brightening again. So what we may very well be seeing is one of these, uh, as you, you saw from the previous Hubble image, multiple nuclei and then something turning on. And the fracturing of comets uh, can do um, two things. They can either uh, make things just dissipate into the wind or they can um, suddenly open up a very fresh uh, spot uh, for it to become very active and outgas a lot and create uh, uh, an immense brightening. Uh, some of you will remember Comet Holmes from a decade ago. It brightened, I can't remember how many million times it was, but it was somewhere around 15th magnitude and it brightened right up to um, second magnitude. Um, and apparently it does this every uh, 80 years or, or every uh, seven or eight times around the sun. Uh, so it's very unpredictable. And that's one of the, the, the key takeaway of um, the whole thing is try as you might, comets are reliably unreliable. Uh, they will do uh, what they want. Some of them go along perfectly as predicted, and then others, they fracture, flare up, and then disappear. Um, so one of the things as we get um, uh, closer to uh, Comet Atlas doing its uh, sharp bend around the sun is that um, we, we are getting into a uh, sort of a parallel situation to uh, what happened with Comet McNaught back in 2006. Um, this uh, image of uh, Comet McNaught was taken uh, much farther south than our latitudes here. Um, they had a fantastic, uh, well, just about Comet of the Century uh, so far, uh, um, as viewed uh, from the south. Uh, it was even visible in daylight uh, briefly as it rounded the sun. But the uh, key thing here to note is uh, the tail, which is, of course, uh, the dust in this case. Uh, very little uh, gas tail, which would be heading off to the upper right here. But most of this is uh, dust. And the dust is from sunlight scattering. And one of the most interesting things that happened uh, is that even though the comet itself, the, the head of the comet, was not visible from here, uh, 
um, from Italy and the middle uh, uh, segment of the states, what they saw over the southern horizon or above the southern horizon were these streaks of light and which would be the tail of the comet um, sticking up, uh, scattering sunlight very nicely. And uh, this is something we actually expect to happen with Comet Atlas. Uh, dust uh, um, behaves very differently depending on the angle that the sun uh, scatters off of it. And I made a little video uh, to show this, and hopefully this should work nicely. There we go. Um, sorry for the slightly jarring motion. I'm, I'll loop this again as it goes through. But it's a layer of dust sitting on my guitar, for those of you who are very good at shapes. Um, I'm looking at it from above and then very slowly moving the camera into a shallower and shallower angle. And as you can see, the sun, in this case, which you cannot see, the sun is uh, coming through the window from uh, ab from uh, above and I'm getting closer and closer in line with it. And you can see that layer of dust getting brighter and brighter and brighter as that angle diminishes. And so uh, that is what is going to be happening with Comet Atlas. As it's getting closer and closer to the sun, this forward scattering angle is getting shallower and shallower. And so we expect the dust to get brighter and brighter. Uh, something that uh, they don't talk a lot about uh, out on the, uh, on the internet too much. Um, but that is something to expect. So even if um, the comet does completely dissolve, although there's momentary uh, hope that uh, we're going to still get something out of it, uh, even if it does dissolve, the dust will still be in orbit around the sun. The dust doesn't just um, evaporate away to nothing um, unless it's very close to the sun where it actually does get vaporized, but uh, out where it is right now, um, it, the, the dust is orbiting the sun. And as that dust lines up and gets into a shallower angle, it should light up. So we're kind of fingers crossed in anticipation that even if there's no head of the comet, we may very well see uh, the tail all by itself. So coming up in uh, May 20, um, first, 22nd, uh, you need to start planning for an all-night session, and uh, it'll be increasingly clear uh, shortly. Uh, but first off, uh, down in the lower left, oh, sorry, I should say, here's the sun. This is at local midnight, 1.30 a.m. Uh, for Albertan times. Um, but Mercury and Venus are having their uh, beautiful uh, conjunction there before um, it gets uh, too dark. But once that, once they set and the sky starts to get a little darker, um, the comet Atlas is going to essentially be uh, just about due north uh, at a local midnight here. Um, now, uh, other things that is interesting. Um, Comet T2 pan stars. For those of you who know your uh, Big Dipper and where Messier 81 and 82 are located, it's essentially just about under the icon of T2 pan stars right there. So uh, that will be interesting. They're passing, it's passing about a degree, one degree from uh, Messier 81 uh, that night. Um, anyways, uh, back to Comet Atlas. So we can expect the tail uh, to, uh, well, part of it, as you can see, the, the straight back from the sun, that would be the position of the gas tail. But the dust tail, which is what we're really expecting, will curve backwards along its inbound trajectory. So in between Auriga to the left and Perseus to the right and uh, trailing up off into the north. Um, and then as we uh, head into the uh, last uh, days of the month, we're kind of hoping for a, a visible and daylight comet, but maybe not. Um, the, the, this is where you should still expect to see, um, well, shouldn't expect, we hope 
that the tail will be strong enough uh, to actually see uh, spouting up towards uh, Polaris from the northern horizon. Um, now, this uh, you'll notice is now at 2.30 in the morning, um, and it's uh, important because the moon starts getting in the way and so in, during the evening hours, so we'll actually want to switch towards morning, although um, it also starts getting lighter at 3 a.m., so you can still uh, get out there, see a comet at 3 a.m., and get back to bed at 4.30, um, so it, it's not as if it's a real all-nighter. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, so um, now what's sort of key in here is where do you want to be in order to see all this happening? And so we take a look at the light pollution map and obviously you don't want to be in Edmonton or to the south of Edmonton because you'd be looking through all the light pollution to uh, the comet. Uh, some of you have uh, seen me post notes. I was at Wabaman, where the W is here. I was looking northwest for when the comets were last month, and that was essentially looking out over this minimum in light pollution. Uh, but as the comet starts moving to the north and northeast, if I went to Wabaman, I'd be looking through um, some increased light pollution, so the idea is no. Uh, the other thing is, uh, say, if you want to go to Blackfoot, which I hear might be reopened, um, is that you're still looking through um, this sort of northern glow. So one of the nice uh, places we figure on going is the Legal site, where you're roughly looking out um, from east of West Lock, uh, so north to northeast, you're looking right out into uh, darkness. So that's uh, uh, Mike Noble's uh, gravel pit near, uh, uh, just north of Legal. So that'll be um, sort of one of the better places. Uh, of course, you could drive east of Towfield in order to look north over the uh, lesser populated areas, or again, a lot farther west and then looking uh, north again. But if you want to try and balance your uh, drive time um, to darkness, uh, Legal is a really good uh, place. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, uh, as reference, uh, here is a shot from Blackfoot. Uh, north is uh, right up, Polaris is right at the top of the screen, uh, um, just uh, right of middle, the Big Dipper uh, center left. And um, although it's not uh, really, really obvious, you can see that there's an increased glow to the left, which is starting to be uh, the uh, towards the light pollution dome of uh, Greater Edmonton. So if uh, any of the comet trail is off towards this part of the sky, well, maybe Blackfoot really isn't that good of a place uh, to be. Um, now, of course, you've all heard that um, Comet Swan is the thing now that uh, uh, Comet Atlas seems to be uh, dissipating. So comets uh, with uh, periods longer than a few hundred years, effectively they arrive randomly in our solar system. And so randomness means sometimes coincidences happen. So in this great coincidence, we've got this lovely new comet that's uh, popped up very quickly just as uh, Comet Atlas uh, happens uh, to be uh, fading out a bit. And uh, so here are uh, two diagrams of this uh, inner solar system. One view on the left, it's as viewed from above uh, the plane and the comet Atlas comes in from the left, swings and then goes down and under, whereas Swan comes in from below up above where the line gets thicker uh, above our solar system and then drops down below again. Uh, as you can see, the two are completely unrelated, and that's what one would expect of uh, comets to begin with. That even if you have three 
four or five comets all are happening within a few months of uh, another. It's all random. And you can well imagine, um, as we had said a while ago, with Comet Hayakataki and Hale-Bopp, they were at their peak in um, the, the Perseus area, and they're only one year apart. Uh, and uh, boy, that would have been something if they had both happened uh, at the same time. What's one year in a hundred thousand? It's uh... sorry, internet connection. Bruce, or I mean, uh, Alistair, we seem to have lost you. You're you're frozen. This internet's gone. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. it just disappeared. Bruce. No, Bruce is still there. Yeah, Bruce. I can see Bruce and and Doug, uh, but Alistair's is is just frozen. Oh, and now he's gone. <laughs> Jeff, we don't see you, Jeff. Oh, I turned my camera off. Hang on. Okay. You're back, Alistair. Oh. You're back. I'm back. Good. Yeah, you disappeared. You. Okay. Um, so uh, you'll have to uh, reshare your screen. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, oh, there we go. Reshare. I don't know what happened. Okay. You can see the uh, star chart again. Yes. Okay. So uh, in uh, in the next upcoming couple of evenings, Comet Swan is coming up from the south. Um, although it is visible from the southern states, it is not visible from here quite yet. Uh, but if we switch over to uh, the morning hour, let's see, come on. There we go. Uh, so three o'clock, which is starting to get uh, uh, closer and closer to um, the, the dawn light uh, increasing. Uh, by the 15th, so uh, we're looking at Friday, uh, we've got a reasonable chance of seeing Comet Swan and its lovely purple tail, but the head is right one degree off the horizon as the, um, the sun is only 10 degrees below the horizon. So we're, you're talking uh, increasingly bright dawn. So that magnificent tail is not going to be obvious um, uh, as we go into the weekend. But uh, the as you can see from the path, it's going to be heading more and more um, north and the comet tail will be sticking up uh, more and more every single uh, morning um, until it arrives in our evening skies. So the key thing here is to um, don't rely on what other people uh, have said last week in some blog post. Go out there and, and have a look for yourself because, of course, there's nothing... Um, that is impossible. So Comet Swan may very well break apart and dissolve, for all we know. Uh, it might break apart and flare into something truly brilliant. We, we just simply do not know. But uh, uh, bring binoculars and uh, it uh, will hopefully be um, a, a very nice comet. Uh, there have been recent reports that it has stopped getting brighter. So uh, third to fourth magnitude seems to be about its peak. Now that is an integrated magnitude. So if you uh, bring all of its light together and compress it down into a point, that's how bright it would be. So visually, it's going to be um, a bit more of a smear, something more like the Andromeda galaxy, for those of you who are uh, familiar with uh, the Andromeda galaxy from a country sky. Hopefully, it'll be a little bit brighter than that. Uh, but uh, we'll we'll just have to uh, go out and have a look. Um, so as we uh, hit that uh, wonderful um, May 20, 21, 22 with Venus and Mercury off to the side, um, the we have the two comets, Comet Atlas here and Comet uh, Swan here, both in, in Perseus uh, in the uh, evening. The tails 
one going up towards the north, the other coming just uh, to the side. So hopefully that should be um, really nice. And that, um, what I showed you in the video with the dust getting brighter as the angle is um, getting reduced, that also applies to uh, Comet Swan. Uh, however, shortly after, um, as in a week later than this, at the end of the month, the angle has gotten worse again and that effect will uh, disappear. So uh, we, we, can't, uh, we can't win on all accounts here. But uh, uh, this is also, um, as you'll see, North Polaris is in the center. So these two objects in the evening hours are to the um, northwest uh, side of things. That's again why Blackfoot is not recommended to go see the comets because you'll be looking through the uh, light domes of uh, the, the greater uh, Edmonton metropolis. Uh, but uh, uh, throw that uh, into uh, the overnight uh, hours and uh, uh, Comet Swan will be uh, a tail going straight up from the horizon. Hopefully it maintains itself and we'll have uh, something uh, pretty nice uh, photographically and also hopefully binoculars. And if we're uh, really lucky, we'll get some noctilucent clouds showing up. It's that season again. And so I can just imagine some um, some comet dust tails and uh, some uh, uh, noctilucent clouds and it'll be uh, really good. Um, so um, the uh, so actually by this point this is when the comet swan's tail starts to not scatter sunlight as best um, or at its best. Now um, that's it for the comets, right? No, but wait, there's more. In addition to the set of Ginsu steak knives, we also get yet another one, Comet F3 NEOWISE. NEOWISE is an acronym for Near Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey. And so this uh, little gem was discovered only six weeks ago, and it pops into our morning sky on July the 5th at third magnitude. So again, a beautiful binocular comet. And so uh, what about this um, light scattering uh, angle? Is it good? It is. So we're just uh, amazingly, incredibly uh, lucky uh, with this. So we're on. Uh, but wait, there's more. Uh, comet U6 Lemon is climbing up to meet Arcturus in August. It'll be uh, a fainter binocular object somewhere around mag 7th or 8th. Um, and is there more? And, and of course, it's remarkably yes. Uh, but that can wait until uh, September. So I will uh, stop there and, uh, that, and take any questions uh, you may have. Hey, thanks, Alistair. Uh, I do, we do have one question that came in while you were talking uh, from Dave Fielder. Does anyone have the coordinates for the Legal gravel pit? I think seem to recall seeing that on the astral list sometime, but uh, do you know what it, what it is? Uh, yes, um, I can't spit it out without uh, getting out and, and uh, going on, but I can post it on uh, Facebook uh, shortly uh, after uh, we finish here unless someone can uh, beat me to it. Okay. Um, actually, while, while I still have the mic, uh, I'd just like to uh, put in a spot for, um, have a look at Stardust, uh, your monthly newsletter that accompanies uh, the meetings, uh, at least digitally. Um, Daisy has done an interview with Chris Mierfeld, and uh, for myself, uh, I've uh, got a little article on how to make a uh, $4 green screen so you can do uh, effects like uh, what you're seeing uh, behind me. It's uh, four green posters from Dollarama. Uh, and uh, I also did a little bit about uh, denoising uh, uh, high ISO grainy images using the uh, free GIMP software. So Stardust, have a look at it. Okay, and someone says, uh, an anonymous attendee says, thanks for the swan song, Al. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Anything else? Stop sharing. Dun, dun. Are there any other questions? Okay. 
Okay. Uh, Abdur, I guess you're up for Astro Imaging Corner. So take it away. Sounds good. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Uh, just going to share my screen here. Okay. Awesome. Well, welcome to uh, Astrology Corner number 101, everybody. Uh, just uh, raise your hand or let me know if you can't hear me well or if you want me to speak louder. Uh, okay, so uh, our first image is from Rick Bram. And uh, Rick and Susan took a trip to New Mexico in February 2020, and Rick got quite a few amazing shots there. Uh, so I'll be sharing a couple of them here today. Uh, this particular image of the Great Orion Nebula was uh, taken with a Celestron Edge HD 11 inch on a Celestron CGX mount. And Drake was using his new uh, Canon EOS RA at ISO 6400, and the image was processed in uh, Photoshop uh, CC. And you can see quite a bit of detail in the central part of the, of the Orion Nebula as well, and the outer regions. Uh, so this kind of high dynamic range is, uh, is very hard to get, so that's a, an amazing job, Rick. The next image here is uh, also from Rick. That's the Crab Nebula, um, SCA1. And uh, this is also with the uh, Celestron Edge HD11 uh, and uh, using the uh, Celestron CGX mount and the same Canon EOS R8. Okay, and uh, next this is Thor's helmet, also from Rick. And this was also with the Celestron Edge HD11 on a uh, Celestron CGX mount. Uh, and uh, also with the Canon EOS RA. And lastly, this is uh, an image of the Orion Nebula complex from Rick. Uh, this particular shot was, a, was with a William Optics White Cat 51 millimeter telescope on a Celestron CGX mount. Uh, and this was a combination of 60 second and 120 second exposures at ISO 6400 with the Canon EOS RA. Uh, so you can see the Horsehead Nebula there along uh, with the Orion Nebula and the associated nebulosity all around that region. Uh, the next image from, is from Alistair Ling. This is a moonrise over downtown Edmonton. Uh, this is, uh, uh, and you can see, uh, uh, it's just a beautiful, uh, I guess that's the sunrise glow perhaps. And uh, this was with a Canon 60 DA and a 40 millimeter wide angle lens. And this is a, a bracket exposure of three separate frames that are merged in a free software called uh, Hugin or Hugin. And this next uh, shot is also from Alistair. This is the moon rising over downtown Edmonton. Uh, and this is uh, actually taken with Mike Noble's old 5D Mark III uh, with a 100 millimeter lens. And this is also a bracket set of three separate exposures combined together uh, to give a, a greater dynamic range. And our next shot is actually of the new uh, supernova that uh, Arnold and I were trying to capture. So this is supernova SN2020 FQV, and this is in uh, a pair of galaxies known as the Siamese Twins. Uh, and this was actually a very faint supernova. This is a magnitude 16 supernova, and you can see it just uh, right over there in the disk of the galaxy. And uh, this was taken with the, an AstroTech 8 inch RC scope and a ZWO 174mm uh, monochrome camera. And this is a total of 23 minutes of exposures and uh, it uh, consists of uh, 46 individual sub exposures. And we were imaging during a half moon pretty nearby at the time, uh, but uh, it, it, it turned out quite well. And this next uh, image is of supernova SN2020 FTL, and this is uh, in a galaxy called NGC 4277. And the supernova is actually uh, actually quite a bit brighter than the core of the galaxy itself, uh, which was surprising. And this is at magnitude 15. Uh, and this is also with the AstroTech ATRC, uh, sorry, the 8-inch RC, and the ZWO ASI 174 monochrome camera. And this was a total of 23 minutes of exposures uh, and consists of uh, 35 individual exposures uh, stacked together. 
And the next image is a uh, comet Alcalus from Alistair. And uh, the really bright uh, object over here is actually not the nucleus of comet Alcalus. That, that's just a 10th magnitude star that happened to be uh, in the field of view. Uh, comet Alcalus is this very, very faint tail-like object. Uh, since the nucleus of the comet disintegrated, it's not, not uh, a bright point source anymore. And this was also with the 8-inch RC at F8 and the ASI-174 monochrome camera. And this uh, was uh, 20 minutes of total exposures. And, uh, and the bright star there for anyone interested is TYC3747, a 10th magnitude star. Uh, and this is the other comet, Comet uh, Pan Stars from Arnold. And uh, this one actually, that is the actual nucleus of the comet visible in the center. That's not a, a star uh, imposter. Uh, so quite a bright nucleus compared to Comet uh, Atlas, sorry, Comet Pan Stars. I don't know if I said Comet Swan, uh, but again, uh, yeah, this is uh, Comet Pan Stars. So we're hoping to image Comet Swan next week or the week after that. We'll see when it comes up. Uh, this next image is from Murray Paulson. Uh, this is the, uh, I guess, the south pole of the moon. You can see uh, the crater of Clavius uh, right down there with tons and tons of little craterlets inside. And uh, Murray took this with an ASI 290 color camera and is a Mulin 250 uh, at F12. So that's 3,000 millimeters uh, on a G11 mount. And the next image is from Mike Clark. This is M63, the Sunflower Galaxy. Uh, Mike got uh, some, more, some more data and combined it with his previous data of the Sunflower Galaxy. And this was taken with an Edge HD uh, eight inch uh, from Celestron, the ASI 294 MC Pro color camera. And this is a total of two hours and 15 minutes uh, of, of integration time. And it's combined in Deep Sky Stacker. Uh, and you can see an amazing amount of detail on the disk of the galaxy. Uh, you can kind of see the, the th 3D structure uh, because of the way the galaxy is oriented in relation to the Earth. So uh, amazing shot. This next shot uh, is one of mine of the Hercules cluster. Um, and uh, the moon was relatively close by and it was half full at the time. Uh, so uh, it was a bit of a challenge to process it, but I think it turned out pretty well. You can see a good number of stars in the background as well. And this was uh, with a Celestron 8-inch uh, classical uh, OTA that I was testing at f6.3 with the Celestron focal reducer. And this was on an EQ6R mount. And I was using my uh, Fuji X-T2 camera at the time, and this is a total of about one hour of integration time uh, consisting of two minute frames at ISO 6400. And they were stacked in Deep Sky Stacker and uh, processed a bit in camera raw. And the last image, this is uh, one of mine as well from uh, about a week ago. This is the crater Copernicus. Uh, and this is also the Celestron 8 inch OTA. Uh, and I was using a 2.5X Celestron Barlow. Uh, so I was imaging at 5,000 millimeters and uh, I was using the EQ6R mount and uh, the video mode on my Fuji X-T2 camera. And I combined uh, the best 10% of about 6,000 frames that I'd taken in video. Uh, and it was uh, stacked in um, AutoStacker 3 and processed in uh, Registax. Uh, and this crater is about, about a bit over 90 kilometers across. Uh, it's about 3.8 kilometers uh, deep on average, so about the same depth as the Earth's oceans. And those uh, little peaks in the center are about 12 to 1300 meters high. So uh, that would be a good hike here on Earth. And uh, okay, that's it for this week. So thank you very much, everyone. And I hope to see uh, more submissions next month. Thank you. Okay, I'll uh, give the control back to you now, Jeff. Okay, thanks, Abdur. That's great. Uh, thank you. I'm going to teach me how to do that stacking. That's just, for that's sure. just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. I might do a, for a next Astro Imaging Community Cafe, I might uh, do another. Okay. Another All right. We're almost done. We've got a few announcements here. Um, okay. Uh, this went out this morning. Uh, so probably a lot of you already know this, but uh, Northern Prairie Star Party has been canceled for this year. Uh, that's the world we live in. And if you saw my uh, uh, write up in Stardust, uh, the Beaver Hills uh, Labor Day event has also been canceled. Um, 
Now we do have some things going on. Uh, we do have uh, some webinars and Astro Cafes coming up. Uh, in a couple of days on the 15th, uh, Abdur is gonna do an Astro Imaging Cafe uh, online. Uh, the details are on the website. On the 22nd, Alistair is going to be doing his uh, part two of his introduction to stargazing. And uh, on the 3rd of June, I'll be doing uh, what's up uh, in the sky over Edmonton in, in June. Uh, these are all on Wednesday night. They're all at 7.30. Uh, details can be found on the website, uh, although I haven't posted mine yet, but it'll be up there soon. Um, next month, uh, we will have uh, Phil Groff, the executive director of uh, the society, uh, coming to us uh, via Zoom. Uh, so he'll have some interesting stuff to say, I'm sure. I don't know what's gonna happen in September. Uh, I was coordinating with uh, Calgary Center uh, to have David Levy come uh, and speak to us. I don't know if that's gonna happen. Just, you know, watch the website and uh, we'll, uh, We'll figure something out. If he if he doesn't come in September, we'll try and get him at another time. Um, I don't think he'd want to do it on Zoom because he's he's got a book he's uh, promoting, and yeah, we'll see what happens. Anyway, um, oh, also I did see someone answered a question here uh, about that gas. Uh, no, I can't find it. Oh dear, it's gone. Sorry. Uh, someone answered the uh, the, the gas question. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, oh wait, here maybe this is it. Uh, yeah, I have some images of a Canadian astronomer in Ontario in 1973. I was shooting in a 16 millimeter film. As a Ryerson student, is this Russ Sampson asking this or no? I don't know. Uh, when we, Paul Sampson, sorry, okay. Uh, when we went to see him, we visited his observatory. I wanted to see if anyone can identify who he is and if there's any way for me to share a still image or two with the group, or should I just use the list or Facebook? I'd put it on Facebook. Um, you know, I'm gonna hit answer live. And he says, thanks. Yeah, just put the picture on Facebook and we'll see if anyone can figure out who he is. Thanks. And of course that, let's see, done. Okay, unless there's nothing else, I will say thank you very much for attending um, our Zoom meeting. Um, one day we will meet again in person. I should have uh, Vera Lynn singing, we'll meet again, but uh, I just thought of that. So, uh, so I will say good night. So thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists, uh, Doug, Abdur, Alistair, Bruce, and Mike. Um, I will, uh, this is being recorded, so I'm going to post some highlights onto our, uh, on our YouTube channel once I do some editing. So, all right. So good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, guys. <laughs>